Welcome back, ye old comrades and comlads. Yeah, our listeners can't read it, but he literally wrote old with an E for this intro. And as the late, great Robin Williams once said, what year is it? That's it? You're not going to give me any more than that? What year is it? All right, it's a little better. So the year is 2022, I think. I mean, we're recording in 2021, but assuming you're listening to this on your phone or whatever, uh, you've either hacked into our Google Drive or it's 2022. Which raises the age-old question, if a podcast is recorded and no one is around to hear it, does it exist? Question that's plagued mankind since Aristotle to Andrew Cuomo. Yeah, that's some plague. Yeah, well, it was Homer in like the year 922 BC when the question was first posed. Does the... What is it with you and the stories that start like 3,000 years ago or more? Like I could start talking about bananas and you'd be like, let me tell you a little story about 4,000 years ago. Yeah, well, actually with bananas, there is a really interesting... Stop, stop, stop. The United Fruit Company in... No, no, you gross Michelle blight like and mother... Are you done? Are you done? So I guess I shouldn't tell you what the episode's about. Is it bananas? Did I ruin the segue into the topic? Nah. So what do you like more than bananas? Uh, whiskey. Fair and appropriate. We're talking Ireland. I was going to mention the obvious fact about Ireland, you know, transporting bears on boats. So Ireland invented the circus. I thought that was like a Roman thing or something. Uh, maybe? I don't know. It's a good question. Okay, so you're just going to lead with transporting bears on boats and just not explain it any further? Oh, so now you want to hear my fun facts. You know what? Now I don't. The episode's over. We're done. Well, too bad. Welcome to the Poor Pearls Almanac. My name is Andy, and my precocious co-host is Elliot. We welcome you to the year 2022, and I'm sorry, it's not going to be better. Today we're talking about indigenous Ireland, and sorry Irish people, that's not you. So this episode is apologizing to Irish people that aren't Irish. Well, yes Yes and and no, yes and no. I know, I'm going to have to get that tattooed on your forehead. Yeah, I, I don't hate that idea. So let's talk about these Irish bears. Well, they're technically not Irish, they're brown, but you know what I mean. Actually, before we get into that, let's talk about the fact that This is the first episode of a new series, actually the second season specifically of our Pro Model series, where we take a look at various indigenous land management practices to understand some insight into our ancestors across the globe and how the unique conditions influence their land management practices. Yeah, so you just want to talk about how fun it is to put bears in boats. So I know bears can stand up, and I'm just imagining a bear doing that on a boat. It's a really funny image that in no time, I think, will evolve into bear pirates, because that's how my brain works. And this conversation is your dream fuel for the ages. So I do know that if you eat bananas before you like go to sleep, you can have crazy dreams. And I think I just incepted myself with bear pirates for the next couple of weeks. So that's going to be fun. It's going to be real fun when it's the porn parody of it. Bear butt pirates of the Caribbean. Y- you went there, huh? Someone had to. We're talking about bears and boats. I mean, come on. So talking about bears and boats, the question that has been left unanswered is how the fuck did people bring bears and boats thousands of years ago? Let's rewind. If you don't know, Ireland is an island. I know. I just made your brain explode. Because of this and its location so far north, it was one of the later uh, land masses to be inhabited by humans. The early Holocene, that is about 100,000 years ago, saw the establishment and expansion of woodland as the dominant habitat on the island of Ireland. Cool. So can we fast forward a little bit? (sighs) Okay, fine. So obviously, when it comes to the data available, we have to take what we find and try to figure out what it implies, because it's never like, this is how it was. Evidence exists showing things like wild dog and boar being present from the earliest stages of the Mesolithic. That's like... 8,000 years ago, and while bear was first evidenced in archaeological records in the late Mesolithic, which is around 4,000 years ago, which bears the question. (laughs) Yeah, it's like you learned comedy and humor from watching Friends, and I know you didn't, so I don't know how to 
There's no excuse for you. I don't know what's wrong with you. Well, I needed friends somehow. So how did the bears get there? Uber. You mean Uber. You know what? Give me my whiskey ration for the day because I think I need a moment. Sorry, bud. I just set myself up for that. I feel like an idiot. Gonna be unbearable. So it's actually entirely speculative that bears were brought by people, but we do know their arrival was pretty sudden, which kind of limits the options. They weren't the only species thought to have been brought over by humans. There's a little bit of evidence of mammalian fauna before humans, especially when we're talking about these larger mammals. Uh, there, there's pretty much nothing. Even species thought to be kind of ubiquitous to Ireland, such as the red deer and the aurochs, seem to have been absent in the early Holocene and are really only documented during the Neolithic. So this introduction of boar and dog and possibly bear to Ireland by definition, includes moving animals, probably as acts of subsistence or as companions and probably animals of symbolic interest. Essentially, they were engineering the ecologies to enhance specific niches, but we don't really fully understand the relationships that linked these people with the animals. So they brought the mammals with them to make the new place they moved to feel more like home? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the equivalent of like Italians bringing pasta to America. Irish brought bears. It's the same thing. Yeah, but this sounds like a scene out of like Family Guy or something where like there's a group of people on a boat and they put a bear on it. and Like, just... like a 10 foot boat and there's like a giant bear on one end and like a bunch of scared people on the other end. Yeah, that, yeah. that's exactly what I picture. And then the boat lands and everybody's like, all right, stretch it out a little bit. All right, we ready? And then the people just start running and the bear starts chasing them again because it feels like home now. Exactly. You know, you got to bring a little bit of that home with you. So obviously, we're talking about people showing up to an island and then trying to inhabit it and manage it the way either reflects what they've traditionally done or to take advantage of what's available there. Being Ireland, there's a lot of fishing, but food procurement was actually focused more on gathering of plants. And this included things like seeds and fruits and roots and leaves and stems. Plants were gathered not just for food, but also for the manufacturing of things like clothing, tools, and structures, as well as the production of medicine and probably, and I say probably pretty loosely, definitely with the intent of consumption of hallucinogens. So what you're telling me is these people invented whiskey, they rode in boats with bears, and were doing probably mushrooms and like mushroom tea and stuff. They didn't have like to work a job other than getting all this stuff. They sound like kings and queens of like a better time. <laughs> To be fair, if you're doing various hallucinogens and getting drunk, riding in bears seems like a great idea. I mean, I'm not going to say I've had worse ideas, but I mean, we've all been there, really. Come on. Yeah, so I guess I'll explain more about the hallucinogens. I feel like that's right up my alley. So we don't really know for sure, but there is a long history of use of magic mushrooms, psilocybin and Amanita muscaria, but there are at least eight different varieties that are native to the island of Ireland. So there is a long history of like, you know, prehistoric rock art swirl designs. And I don't think they're paintings. I think they're, I don't know how they did it. It's not carvings. Maybe it is painting, but given the design style, the way it looks, you could easily see the artists being influenced by hallucinogens. Not that we're talking from any place of experience. I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so so there's some really interesting insight into the utility of taking these types of mushrooms. It, it's not totally surprising because fall is the best time for harvesting, and it's also the best time for harvesting these things. It's not a surprise then when we think about like Halloween that stems from a pagan holiday from Ireland that they would imagine all these things happening or that there were ghosts and goblins and leprechauns and I, I honestly can't speak any further about it, but it's not a coincidence, I don't think. No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure there was a whole ritual and ceremony where all this is done. I don't think people were just munching on mushrooms, walking around doing their day-to-day -day work. But yeah, I think they were present in the way they used them medicinally and like herbally, basically, for like yeah. shamanistic purposes. Yeah, I don't mean to say that it was like they're just getting high for the sake of getting high. I mean, they could have also been the case. They could have also been doing that. Yeah. So basically, we're, we're, we're getting into a roundabout way of saying Stonehenge was obviously a party spot, and I think people overthink that one. <laughs> Ley lines are for getting laid. Like, we all know that. <laughs> well, this has gone terribly off track. So to circle back, let's talk about the forgotten forested Ireland. 
So these wooded landscapes, unsurprisingly, weren't significantly different from most of the UK. There's a boatload uh, of evidence of things like hazelnut shells being burnt in controlled fires. Archaeologists have found things like caches of hazelnuts at a number of historical sites. The storing of plant foods is often considered to be associated with things like agricultural societies, but there is a history as well for hunter-gatherers in Mesolithic Europe. Not only is there extensive evidence of hazels being stored and eaten, cooking sites were discovered that also had charred remains of things like pears and apples, crowberries, raspberries, and waterlogged remains of things like brambles, which are traditionally used in things like basket making, and as well as gelderose. Now, gelderose berries are inedible unless they're cooked or made into wine, but raw have a long history of being used as like an herbal remedy that causes cramping. While many of these fruits were autumn ripening, it should be noted that with crowberries, they can remain on a plant through the winter and are traditionally like a bird feed that they subsist on primarily during those colder months when there's less food around. But for humans, this can extend your harvesting period. With the possible exception of crowberry, these fruit bearing plants are traditionally associated with like the woodland margins, further emphasizing the importance of the original wooded landscapes and ultimately the management of that forest during this time to increase the food security strategies. So let me get this straight. They're pretty much hanging out, doing all of their day-to-day -day hunting and gathering during the year. And then in the late summer, early fall, they take a little head trip and then they make their, you know, gelder roseberry wine and then get drunk all winter. Yeah, just about. I feel like I'm Irish. Yeah, I, I can see it. Like right in that like spot... That paler spot right on your cheek. What? It's just a... <laughs> it's sneaking out. The Irish. I think my brother sold his DNA to one of those DNA places, and they came back and said he was like 11% from Great Britain, like that area. So maybe maybe Moorish? I don't know. I know the Moors got around. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, me neither. Moving on. The Irish have also, on top of these fruits and nuts, a super long history of eating tubers. You don't say. Ah, uh, yeah. So we're not going to talk about those tubers. But there is evidence of charred tubers of lesser celandine and species in the sedge family, which have also been recorded, and all of which have really traditionally inhabited the forest floor. And those aren't really the only ones that have existed either in forests or on the forest edges. Things like cleavers, which is a small annual plant, as well as bed straws, both of which typically inhabit, again, the forest edges, have been extensively documented from the various cooking sites that have been found. Cleavers were also the most common charred plant other than fruit and nut remains at many of the sites that have had some archaeological work done, uh, which is really interesting because that would suggest like massive amounts of tree margins. And if we think about some of the stuff we've talked about in this podcast about like the coppicing and woodlands management, margins are a key point for most of the societies we've been talking about. Further, hazels, which we've talked a ton about at this point, generally exist on the forest edge, suggesting that essentially these forests became a patchwork on the island as opposed to this one dense mass. Now, there is also evidence to plants from environments other than woodlands, which I don't think even on this podcast we've really given any attention to. Things like yellow and white water lily have been recorded as uh, their seeds being used in cooking, sometimes in massive quantities, highlighting the importance of the water-saturated environments that we traditionally think of when we're talking about Ireland. Now, while water lilies naturally produce like a ton of seeds, their recovery from archaeological deposits and in a charred state suggests a lot of human involvement. Yeah, so that last bit reminds me of when we had a conversation about the Japanese Satayama landscape and how they created more variety and complexity in their systems by creating those edge spaces where there seems to be a bit more variety in plant and animal species. And they've done the same thing sort of in Ireland, but instead of I mean, I guess there's still bogs and stuff like that. There's not so much terraced rice paddies, but it still creates that same edge space and makes more, I guess, you know, surface area so that there's more complexity and variety around rather than just having a big clump of forest and just one border going like around the island or the middle of the island or something like that, right? 
Yeah, it adds a lot of diversity. And uh, again, that human involvement targets the things that create the best environments for what we need to survive. And what's really particularly interesting is, you know, we've talked about all these different foods that are still wild in uh, across the globe. And none of that is really carried forward in terms of like Irish identity. And it's really crazy to think about how we can become so quickly disconnected. For, well, I say quickly, but in terms of the human existence quickly, we've become quickly disconnected from like our culture and our identity. It's like thinking about like a pre-tomato Italy, which is only a couple hundred years ago. And even if you know it existed, it still doesn't really like feel right. <laughs> I've been watching The Sopranos, and uh, there's a character in it that talks about the rape of the culture of Italy, and it's pretty funny. So I'm just going to call you Tony Soprano. <laughs> Matt, Matt again. It's anti Italian American discrimination. Yeah. Is that, <laughs> was it Polly Walnuts? I think it was Polly. Hey, Paul Lee. Yeah, I'm not doing an Italian American accent. I'm sorry. I can't do it to my people. <laughs> when you fly, Fly with us. Enjoy our panoramic windows, fresh fish, and nonstop flights to Ireland. United Bear Lines, where everywhere bears care, we fare with flair. Find out more at porporals.com. So what's really interesting about water lily seeds as a food source is that they have a super intense processing need. You can pretty much take every processing practice that you would do for anything, and you have to do like all of it. It involves gathering the seed capsules, fermenting them in water, cleaning the seeds after, dehusking, winnowing, parching, grinding, and then roasting. The process takes a minimum of two weeks, and that time frame really highlights the extensive process of preparing that to become a food. Alternatively, the seed can just be fried in fat and made into like a popcorn. So are we going to eat some of that? Hey, was it you that had me? No, yeah. Are we going to try that? Are we going to try to, like, pond popcorn? I don't have water lilies, so I don't have pond corn, if that's what you're asking. Was it you that made me try popped sorghum? That was not me, but I I want to hear more about it. It was the same thing. We just popped sorghum like popcorn because I didn't know how else to prepare it. It was a new ingredient for me at the time. And what did it taste like? Uh... It was like popcorn, but it had a like a nutty, like a nuttier taste to it than popcorn. Ooh, I like it. Yeah, it was pretty good. Covered it in butter. Yeah. Well, now you got to get me some. Can't not deliver on this. It's not delivery. It's bears. It's bears. I don't. I don't it's the drawer now. <laughs> it's bears. It's bears. We're not letting bears and boats go. Sorry about that. Not sorry. Nope. Sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> Hashtag. So moving on in boats. Yes. <laughs> We're going to talk about fishing. This is going to be back into the idea of the managed woodlands, and I promise. Things like fishing structures and fishing baskets can provide some really good evidence of human activity and also speaks to how the resources, those baskets and things like that, are were consistently made as they needed them without, again, destroying the ecosystem. So one of the things that we've seen in some of the research that's gone into finding some of these old baskets at the bottom of rivers and things like that is that we can take a look at the what we pull out of it and look at things like the age profiles of the wood remains from the things we're able to pull out of decaying rivers and things like that. And there actually was a very big discovery outside of Dublin a few years ago. And what they actually found was that the hazel used in the construction of the traps that they found was on a coppice rotation of about eight to nine years with another possible cycle indicated at around five years, which is just like wild that they can find a piece of wood and just look at it and find that much out about it. Yeah. So they were managing woodlands similar to the British at the time, I think. And is it around the same time or later? Uh, It's around the same time, if not maybe a little bit later, because again, if we think about that human migration north, uh, it wasn't until the Ice Age started waning that Ireland became more of a feasible place to go. Right. They started to creep north then. Yeah. So like biologically speaking, the Irish are English. Don't. And now we're going to get a bunch of hate mail for that. Yeah. You shouldn't have said that. (laughs) There have been wars over that shit. Yeah. No. (laughs) So, um. As they creep north then, they're still using those land management practices similar to the British, but you know they're using poles from the coppicing for fishing, and they're using the smaller 
plants to weave baskets and, and things like that, while also eating the nuts from the hazels and taking advantage of those edge spaces and creating margins within the forest to allow species that they do eat to flourish. I feel like we've heard all this before on a dope ass podcast. Am I right? Uh, I don't know. I don't listen to podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it seems to be a common theme across the globe, at least. And we've taken a look at some of the management practices by the people who inhabited Ireland. I, I want to look a little bit at the bigger scope for a second, because Ireland's ecological history is really interesting and both speaks to how humans interact in a dialogue with the landscape, as well as thinking about how important it is for humans to be able to pivot based on new ecological conditions. So as the Ice Age waned- Really? We're going way back in time again? Which Ice Age? Is it the first one, the second one, the fourth? Because I'm pretty sure this planet's been covered in ice more time than it hasn't. So be specific. Yeah. So for like a second, the most recent Ice Age waned and the first species to kind of take over as the primary tree of Ireland was actually the juniper. And that was quickly replaced by birch and then hazel and pine and elm and oak became the dominant tree across the island around like 7,000 BC. Okay, so I don't know if that adds up because I believe when I was reading part of the research for this episode that oaks had already become the dominant species when humans began to bring over pigs and dogs, but we haven't talked about them yet as food sources. Exactly. Humans showed up and then began restarting the successional clock to bring back the species they wanted to eat. The ones, again, that were familiar to them where they had lived for whatever reason they decided to leave. And this created those landscape mosaics where they began clearing some of the forests. This created a variety of early successional plant communities and ecotones. These clearances would have functioned in like a number of different ways from opening up space for grazing animals, whether they were livestock or animals brought in to eat like, again, the pigs or whatever. And those optimized the conditions for the understory, the, the nuts and the berries and all that good stuff. So let's fast forward a little bit, like to 6,000 years ago or so. Yeah. So like 2,000 years BE, 2,000 years ago BE? Uh, BE? Yeah. Bears, like bears entering the picture. Ah, all right. So 2000 BE, quote unquote, or 4000 BC for the rest of us, we have the first clear documentation of domesticated animals in Ireland, and that's cow bones. But oddly enough, there isn't much evidence of this suggesting that people may have actually tried to get into animal agriculture and then rejected it. However, the island was beginning to experience some really rapid climate change, which significantly reworked the landscape. Recent work on dendrochronology-dated bog oaks suggested that Ireland was affected by a series of climatically driven hydrological changes around the same time period, around 6,000 years ago. Drier conditions started around exactly like 6,100 years ago with wetter conditions becoming more evident by like 5,500 years ago. And there's also clear evidence of an extremely severe climactic downturn around 3,200 BC, so again, about 5,200 years ago, suggesting that the second half of the fourth millennium was like a time of severe climate uncertainty. Doesn't sound familiar at all. So this climate change wasn't just tied to Ireland, but had been implicated in the transition to agriculture in all of Northwestern Europe and has become the focus of several recent investigations. The major event associated with the onset of agriculture traditionally placed around 4,000 BC. Or 2,000 BE. <laughs> I've dendro chronologically dated bog oaks. That's a that's a mouthful. You had a hard time with that, and I thought it was funny. I'm glad I am here to entertain you. It, you amuse me, clown. I, I do. I'm just gonna put on my show. Uh, so dance, <laughs> dance, son. Uh, 2000 BE. Right around that time is what's called the elm decline. So that was one of the major trees of the mature forests of Ireland. And this is characterized by a decline in the presence of elm in many of the pollen diagrams across northwestern Europe. So this wasn't just an Irish thing. Like the climate of the entire northwestern part of Europe just got totally destroyed and caused all these problems within the forests and the ways people lived. In Ireland, the event is frequently accompanied by some of the first most indisputable evidence for agriculture linking it to anthropogenic activities. More recently, other explanations have been proposed, like I was saying, climate changing or a disease that might have started wiping out these trees. 
So based on the evidence, there seems to be a, a uniform phased event over this elm decline. It seems like it's actually pointing to the fact that it's a mix of all of these things together, where there was land clearance because of agriculture, you had a disease, and you had massive climate change. All of these three things just fed into it and essentially caused the landscape to have to change in order to support a way of living that kept people alive. Yeah, it sort of created like a new economy, like a new normal economy. I just triggered myself. So what came first, the elm decline or like the rejection of agriculture? So that's the million dollar question. It's academia, so maybe not like a million dollar. It's probably like a strongly worded letter of support for like a 10-year track job and maybe a Klondike bar. <laughs> or a Klondike bear. <laughs> I made a you joke. I hate myself. There you go. So let's learn a thing. While we have strong evidence for extensive forest clearance in some parts of Ireland, in other parts, the situation is a lot less clear with more ambiguous episodes of clearance or very low levels of activity. The diversity we see within the published pollen records suggests that organization of the landscape varied regionally and temporally. The association between things like early agriculture and the elm decline is seen in many polygram records, and it seems that it wasn't completely synchronous across the entire island, starting earlier in the north compared with the west, but that there is a strong coincidence with early agriculture in many sites. So what that would say to me is that agriculture was probably taking place as the trees started dying off because of the fact that they were starting to think about, okay, the trees are dying, we need to think about a stable food system. But during this period, there's a lot of evidence of changes in settlements. Around 5,500 years ago, a couple of hundred years into this process of the Dutch elm decline, we see a decrease in the frequency of things like cereal evidence, which obviously is a something that would come from agriculture, and a return and increase in a lot of like wild foods such as fruits, but oddly not nuts, alongside evidence for reforestation and pollen diagrams over about 500 years up until about 3000 BC. It seems like this point, uh, Irish history was like just a massive amounts of, of change in terms of how they were living, uh, what the ecosystem looked like, what it could support. And uh, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is the agriculture didn't come from people in Ireland. A lot of evidence points to the fact that a lot of farmers came to the island whether that was by force or not, bringing agriculture with them. Okay, so let me clean that up for the layman people like myself. In 2000 BE, people tried to settle down and stay in one spot and sort of learn new ways to manage the landscape while being stationary. And then climate change and a few other factors forced them to get their asses nomadic right quick and in a hurry around 1000 BE. So see, I can sound scientific too. Yeah, sounds... Fantastic. Uh, the BE is really crucial in understanding the following of what's going on. I'm going to go get some camembert cheese while you do this. While I'm whining? Yeah, this is unbearable. You're right. Hey there. Is your name George? Do you use foundations to funnel money to organizations to bypass tax regulation? Are you recognized as maybe funding radical leftist movements across the globe? Well then, this commercial is for you. Specifically you, George. My name is Andy, and the Poor Pearls Almanac is looking for you. Come fund our program. We've got boomsticks. We collectivize the energy of the sun with plants. If this sounds like an ad made explicitly for you, go support the Poor Pearls Almanac at poorproles.com. Okay, so after decades of debate, ancient DNA is now providing some strong evidence that Ireland and Britain were at the western end of this really long process of population movements involving the spread of farming, uh, ultimately from Near Eastern ancestry. The arrival of farming coincided with new ways of living, which we've been hinting at, including the introduction of pottery, because you need to be able to store things, grinding stones such as uh, saddle corns, substantial rectangular homes and things like mortuary monuments for the dead. These ceramic vessels, like I said, were primarily used for like storing, processing, and presenting foods while the corns enabled new ways of processing foods. 
If you're not familiar with corns, they're essentially the OG grain mill. And it's like a half bowl. Like it just looks almost like a plate that's like raised on the sides and a pestle. These new houses that they built for all this stuff had to exist because now they needed a place to store their storing facilities, as well as the materials they needed to prepare and consume foods, especially when it's not things that quickly degrade. And this caused people to have to figure out new ways in which they could do things like eat meals and, again, access those foods. Yeah, it sounds like they're, you know, our ancestors sort of domesticated themselves in the home after living pretty nomadically for a period of time, which is basically what this sounds like. And we're sitting here talking about making self-determination trendy again. Yeah, sort of. So it's important to understand when we're talking about like these time frames, how long of a time frame we're really talking. These aren't overnight changes. We, we're talking about like a thousand years. That's so like what, 500 generations. Mm. So these things take time. And what's really interesting is that when we're talking about this type of a period, there's a lot going on in terms of the earth heating and cooling again, uh, which can cause stress on these communities as and their ways of living. It's also important to remember that when we're talking about this, that just because farming came to Ireland, that people just decided like one day or within a couple generations that they just wanted to stop moving and that was that. These periods have traditionally been documented as being like extensively um, tense in terms of strife and people fighting over the way they wanted to live, especially when farming took place in the places where there were the most fertile lands, which would obviously be the most productive sites for things like foraging or land management. Yeah. So basically domesticated or not, no human is immune to being hangry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so these were not necessarily easy transitions. You know, some would argue that these weren't necessarily progress even to this day. That said, the first evidence of those cereals is dated from around 3600 BC. Again, when we think about, we were just talking about that same period around 6,000 years ago is when agriculture showed up. Uh, it was also a lot of change going on in terms of the landscape getting wet and then drying out. Farming showed up and then kind of disappeared a little bit. It was more scattered. But the point is that like at this point, we're seeing the cereals show up. Things like emmer wheat, which dominated the fields, were there. Things like barley were also recorded. And various plant remains continued to be recorded at later Neolithic sites. But cereals became absent over a time, suggesting, again, that uh, this arable agriculture or decision to use these foods that had been brought in ultimately changed for one reason or another. And this might have been part of that long history globally of refusing to settle into these agricultural types of societies. And this may have been a period where they returned to that hunter-gatherer format, like we saw with that increase in things like fruits, but not nuts, which I kind of wonder if that had to do with maybe the hazelnuts being cleared or something like that. But in common with cereals, animal bones were also frequently found in these sites. In many cases, these were small and not really identifiable. And when they were identifiable, they were pretty clear what they were. It was either sheep or goat or cattle, closely followed by pig. So did the cows literally come home or were they brought by boat? Because by the end of this episode, I'm going to make it sound like they had some sort of primitive version of Instacart for like large mammals. And was it 3000 BC now? Something like that. 3500 BC. BE. So it's like Instacart, like 24 year guaranteed delivery. Yeah, that's not bad, I guess. In your lifetime, right? Insta-cow? It's not insta-bear. It's got to be insta-cow, I guess. I mean, it sounds like they put every large mammal on a boat and was like, you're coming with. So it was Noah's Ark, but with bears? I guess Noah's Ark probably had bears, huh? I, I would assume. Like in this, this discussion where we're pretending that's real. <laughs> so anyways, at sites where cereal was recorded, the other complementary things like ceramic vessels were always present. And when cereals were not present, ceramics were often not there either. So the idea of like when they were or weren't using grains is actually a really good tool to figure out if they were continuing to do like a sedentary lifestyle or if they had returned to more of that hunter-gatherer type of life, which I think is really interesting. What's also interesting, or at least so far and what we've covered, is the lack of foods from the ocean. So in all of the materials that they found, we haven't really talked about like fish or anything like that. But it is worth noting that when we're talking about like what we know about what they ate, we rely on things like charred remains and isotope analysis. The actual food remains are pretty rare in archaeological record. 
So we're really limited in what we can understand was being eaten. The only thing that we really we've been able to find in recent years in terms of residue analysis is that in these ceramic vessels from the Neolithic sites in Ireland, again, we're talking about sedentary sites, not the hunter gatherers because they have the ceramic vessels is a clear evidence of predominantly dairy products being used and often even meats and vessels. Yeah, so fun fact I read, Irish people are statistically one of the least likely groups of people to be lactose intolerant, and only 5% of Irish people are lactose intolerant versus about a third of the general population. It's interesting, but also why, why do you know that? Do you really want to know? I mean, when you put it that way. All right, then. Uh, I was just guessing. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I've had a few Irish ex-girlfriends. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, but I'm also guessing that, you know, the high amount of dairy in their diet has something to do with their lactose tolerance or production of lactase, which is the enzyme that helps you break down lactose, because not everybody makes that. Yeah, I'm not a scientist. So much like most white Americans, I'm going to speculate wildly and agree with you on that. Yeah, listen, if you want to be a famous one, you got to speculate wildly. Fine. ZZ Top suggests there's a ZZ Bottom. That's not what I meant, Andy. Uncle implies that before you have nieces and nephews, you're just a coal. That was the last time you were a coal. Big maple syrup is secretly- Stop wildly speculating and go back to regular speculation, please. Fine. So back to our regularly scheduled speculation. So historically speaking, soon after documented evidence of the cereal crops showed up in Ireland, there's a reduction in archaeobotanical data around 3400 BC. After 3400 BC, again, we're talking like at the later stages of that big climate change, barley occurs on slightly more sites than wheat, suggesting that there's also an increase in fruit remains compared with earlier periods. This is usually accompanied by a decrease in things like hazelnut remains, suggesting variability of the use of wild and gathered foods at this time. I'd be interested to also know whether or not farmers actively went out and tried to destroy the wild foods so that the hunter-gatherers couldn't coexist on the landscape with them. And that just occurred to me right now as we're talking. But now that makes a whole lot of sense. That would be a part of why things like staple crops, the most important crops like proteins, would have disappeared even when people went back to hunting and gathering because it takes years for those trees to get back to a point where they're producing. So just a thought. Now, none of this happened in isolation. When we're talking about like this climate change, we've talked about the fact that it wasn't just Ireland. It's the entire northwestern part of Europe. So when we see this crop change in terms of the barley, we also see an increase in things like wild plant use in places like Scotland around the same time, alongside a significant increase in the utilization of barley also in Scotland. And what's interesting is that this crop is much more tolerant of cooler and wetter conditions. And a decrease in wheat use in southern and northeast Scotland would suggest, again, that, that climate understanding or that, that bigger picture climate change issue and seeing people make those changes across a wide span, especially communities that probably weren't in close communication with, with one another, which begs the question for you, probably, why are we talking about this? Honestly, I'm not completely sure. Should I wildly speculate? This is America. Uh, is it because you want to make me like miserable with going super far back in time to help me learn about today? Or is it because it shows that there is more than one way to manage a landscape in transitory or uncertain periods of time? Well, yes and no. Well, yes and no. You know, there's no need to get so salty about it. Hashtag brought to you by Lowry's. I'm still waiting on that cease and desist. We can't afford it, but you just won't stop. This is your fault. You introduced me to Lowry's. I'm sorry to everyone. This is my fault. I thought knowledge is for everyone, and I forgot that knowledge is also power, and some people can't handle the raw power of them salty little flavor rocks. Hell yeah. Don't give me flavor rocks. Sounds like I'm talking about something else. (laughs) I can make anything sound like a drug. Yeah, probably. So we're talking about all of this stuff because A, it's fun for me, and two, because Ireland in particular is a really useful example of how people intensively manage the landscape in a variety of ways, while also dealing with this like massive climate change and adjusting their lifestyles based on that. And there was a fluidity that had to exist within the communities to be able to adjust with those changes. That's not to say what they did was right or perfect or what everyone agreed to was the best option. 
And we're really painting in broad strokes because we're talking about thousands of years. But I think it also highlights places where selective breeding could be incredibly useful, as well as species that we've highlighted that we haven't really spent time breeding for food sources. So they can selectively breed for bread, like root bread, getting those root breads. If you make a beer out of those roots, is it root beer? I think so. But what about if you feed those roots to bears? Are they then root bears? You're not going to let those bears go, are you? I couldn't get a boat in there. <laughs> You're trying, though. I'll give you effort. So do you think they had bears in cages, or do you think they just like literally sat them in the middle of the boat? I can't, I can't get over it. I just think it's like nobody said it wasn't a good idea, so they just like did it, and they were like, we're either going to die or we're going to make this trip. Hell yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> bears were the original ride or die. Well, maybe. I don't know. But we'll we'll talk <laughs> about bears uh, even a little bit further. This is so fun. Yeah. Uh, a little bit further on, we're going to talk about bears even more. So I know you guys are so excited to hear more about bears. But let's get back into what these people are eating during this weird transitional period. So we've talked about this climate change that's been happening and the landscape fragmentation from things like farming, the elm disease, all these things. And apparently bears were also hunting for beers. The most commonly documented food source continued to be pretty much hazelnuts in terms of the bigger picture followed closely by cereals, which I think probably speaks to the, the two various communities that were existing in Ireland, the hunter-gatherers and these farmers. That said, there's also evidence of apples and raspberries and even flax and peas, which became more prominent during this time. So while the selective crops for farming were mostly focused on things like cereals, the most common crops that were imported to be grown were primarily einkorn, emmer wheat, barleys, and even things like chickpeas and lentils, which I think is kind of interesting because we don't think of those as Irish foods, all of which had crossed Europe slowly over time and taking about 3,000 years to get from Ireland from Greece. Ireland also inherited some of the other trappings of agriculture as they began to use these crops, including things like using long-lived plots and not changing their growing location for long periods of times, meaning that the plot lands would be used for a decade or more at a time. Yeah, it's a rookie move, guys. You got to keep them systems cyclical and not linear, or at least with as much complexity as you can in there. And it sounds like they kind of simplified it a little bit. But do you think, I'm just making this connection now in my head, that they went from probably using structures that were easy to break down that were probably circular when they were nomadic. And then they went to storing food and using like square linear models, like houses. They're like land management style sort of reflected like where they lived. I don't know. Is that weird? Am I high? It, <laughs> I, I think it is kind of interesting, in symbolically speaking, the, the rigidity of a long-term structure being square or rectangular versus some of the more traditional living styles. But Let's talk a little bit about the impact of this sedentary lifestyle. So the consequences of this introduction of arable farming are obvious in some cases in terms of things like land clearance, which obviously over a millennia changed the Irish landscape. Production and farming is influenced by like a number of different factors, including, again, like we just spoke about farming practices, things like the developments and cultivation methods. That's both in terms of technology and cropping systems and selective breeding size of the population living on the land, and plenty of other things. What's really important in the conversation about Ireland in particular is the natural tendency of the soils in a humid environment to become super acidic and nutrient depleted over time. And these farmers eventually started seeing this happening and decided there was a few methods to help return those nutrients to the soil and help neutralize the pH. The first had to do with using livestock. It was the introduction of cattle and perhaps to an extent sheep that were to have those more immediate and significant consequences. There's also recent evidence that these cows were brought by farmers, like I said, that weren't native to the island. Now, if we examine Ireland's distinctive ecological background here, there's one really significant reason why the introduction of cattle to Ireland was so important. Aside from the fact that several large mammal species were and are absent from Ireland, the crucial fact is that most of the large mammals present in mid-Holocene times in adjacent parts of Europe, like England, were not present in Ireland. So this episode's about man, bear, pigs? Yeah, and aurochs, and elk, and roe deer, and even red deer, which were absent. 
So now all these new animals create a completely new dynamic to the landscape. They graze the forests and uh, the grasslands of the island heavily. And while they can return those nutrients back to the soil, manures can only return part of the nutrients removed in grazing and cropping and hence a search, quote unquote, for new materials, many of them geological, uh, was and continues to be an unending task. So what I mean by this is that as animals grow, their bones and all the other stuff that's a part of them becomes trapped until they die and then slowly leaches back into the soil by adding a whole bunch of things that absorb these nutrients and then taking trees off the land, which can mine deep into the soil, means you've kind of cut off that natural cycle of these things coming into getting back into the soil. So marls and calcareous clays that were available at shallow depths were really easy targets for uh, experimentation for these folks. Additionally, coastal areas were and still are prolific sources of quote-unquote sea manures, and that includes using things like sand and shell and coral and seaweed. Now, pairing and burning the organic surface of soils was a stopgap measure, uh, which helped to release some calcium, magnesium, and potassium. But the element that was in greatest demand both by the crops and the animals was, the, was often phosphorus. The ancient practice of doing things like burning animal bones in midsummer and even fall, the term bonfire actually comes from the Old English meaning bone fire. And they would scatter the embers and ashes on crops, which indicates that the farmers understood the role of the phosphorus, even if they didn't have a name for it, to help build that soil. Yeah, so animals eat phosphorus, they absorb the nutrients, and it basically gets trapped in their bones as they grow and live their life. Yeah. And then after they die, that it takes a bit of time for that nature's process to re um, release that phosphorus and get it back into the soil. Yeah, and obviously that re returning to the soil, I mean, you think about bones in general, you can find bones and uh, they can be sitting out for quite a bit, especially depending on a bunch of different things. But there's a few problems with this, right? Like in terms of how quickly it returns and how focused where those bones are and how that might impact the places where the phosphorus exists within the soil. Right. So we talked about this on the episode about creating natural farming and basically returning those nutrients a bit more quickly with the ability to process and manage those processes so that we can amend the soil and get what we need in there a bit faster than letting nature do its thing. Exactly. So in much later farming systems... Are we still in BE times? No, we're talking about post-bear. And we're talking like almost like medieval ages. The, the manure from things like cattle sheds and other livestock was typically piled on like a dunghill in the farmyard and they would bring it out in, to the fields in a cart. And this is not something that was like unique to Ireland. This is a pretty common practice. And despite the recycling of these waste products back into the soil... Nutrients continued to be lost under the human Irish climate, even though nitrogen fixation through the agency of things like clover helped to get make sure there was at least nitrogen uh, adequate nitrogen levels in the soil. So not only did farmers try to use animal waste, they um, recognized the benefits of things like burning surface vegetation, which was particularly important when things like heath started taking over, which aren't really nutritionally beneficial for livestock or people. Additionally, a lot of these folks, these indigenous people use things like shells to help try to neutralize the soils, add calcium as a, among a bunch of other things, and can be used similarly to things like lime today. It was actually documented that they'd fill boats with shells and bring them back into the mainlands. And not only this, they used the shells that had been underwater, which would have had like a higher sodium content, suggesting they understood the need for their livestock to have access to salt as well. Now, not only did they use things like shells from the ocean, but they also incorporated the marl, which is essentially a lime-rich mud that turns to rock that had existed under like the peat bogs, which they were able to use as a soil amendment. Yeah, so it, it's fascinating to me to, ma to imagine people managing the landscape in this extensive way uh, so long ago. And I bet no one really told them to like quit their day job. <laughs> but I, I think you mentioned the fact that like there's lost knowledge that we just don't know. We can sort of glean some of this information from historical records, but it's also fascinating to understand that they knew when to do all of this, and there was a certain time of the year to get this done, and just knowing how all of this fits together, and then doing that like as you know your day to day mundane work as you go through the seasons. I, it's just interesting to think about. 
Yeah, I think it points to the fact that land management or stewardship or balancing of these ecosystems by humans doesn't necessarily mean that we're in like some like yoga hippie one with nature thing where we just like walk around and, you know, brush our fingers on the leaves and maybe make a couple small changes here or there. And in return, we have like this natural insane abundance. It's not that simple. And with climate change, we have an even bigger responsibility to help these systems evolve with that climate change. Yeah. And keeping systems going. It's a three word way of saying sustainability. And I'm still paying for college, but I do remember that indoctrination. And I'm pretty sure that's what I'm still paying for. Absolutely. But basically what that also means is there's some things that are going to, you know, require hard work. And that work is what makes it sustainable because we're, you know, trying to return those cyclical ways of management and not making everything linear start to end. And then like life, death, rebirth sort of thing we got going on. Yeah. And even like the idea of like closed loop systems, like this required massive inputs from the ocean. And, you know, you could say that's a reason why we shouldn't have left hunter gatherer in the case of like Ireland, but there's multiple ways to skin a bear as they say. Uh, (laughs) uh, So like my eyes just rolled so far back into my head. I can, I can see my brain. Yeah. Uh, How's it looking? It's all gray and gooey that's not good so speaking of gooey things seaweed also played an important role in managing things like soil fertility and creating soils in ireland and particularly in like coastal areas uh yeah so that brings up an interesting concept i wonder what that mutton tasted like if it was fed seaweed for most of its feed only one way to find out you're gonna have to be a bit more specific do i yeah like what you want to get some seaweed and force feed them to your sheep I mean, I got sheep. Beach has seaweed. <laughs> I've harvested seaweed before, and I've had lamb. I don't think I've had like mutton from a sheep before. That's the only mutton there is. So let's put those together. And what do we got? It's probably going to be like a salty version of mutton that sort of tastes like it's got Lowry's on it. Mallory's? Andy? <laughs> yeah, okay, your loss. Anyways. What we see in Ireland, I think, is really important in what our future looks like. The reason I say that is because people are going to have to try different methods to deal with climate change. And while some will want to go back to how things were, uh, whatever that means, pre-fossil fuel here or hunter-gatherer or maybe even to keep chugging along and to fix those potholes as we go, other folks will try to find a way to mix our past and our present to create essentially the most amount of variety possible to weather pretty much any storm. I was going to bring up bears and boats again, but I just can't bring myself to do it. Okay, if you say I've, so. It just, uh, it reminds me of like being down that rabbit hole on YouTube and you end up on like a Russian channel somewhere. I swear I've seen like a bear in a boat and in a car and on a motorcycle. Yeah, the Russians will do that. None of it was in Ireland. <laughs> they love themselves a good like a bear pretending to be people. Yeah. They really do. It's on there. Yeah. I digress. (laughs) So it's uh, worth noting that during abrupt changes like what we're talking about, even in Ireland, there is some evidence that there was a significant population drop off. And the reason that I want to bring this up really quickly before we wrap up is that the technology applied in managing landscapes also seemed to have dropped off at the same time. The current leading argument on the subject, and this is still up for debate, is that lower populations can't handle or can't maintain the complex technologies. So that's part of the complex systems and such that we always talk about? Exactly. So what is kind of interesting, though, is because they, quote unquote, slid back to older technologies while having ancestral knowledge, we'll call it, of newer technologies, because again, we're talking about generations and generations, not like your grandfather to you. They were able to improve on the older technologies with their understanding of how different things work. Yeah, and that's the point that makes this relevant to the whole podcast and what we're about. Yeah, I think so too. Like, I should point out that this is actually still significantly up for debate uh, and that we're painting in broad strokes, like I said, like a thousand years. So not only does this correlation not necessarily equate causation, But I think it points to how we need to think about the future and the past and, you know, something as simple as, okay, if, you know, worst case scenario, we're talking about the end of the world, like in a shitty movie for white dudes to feel empowered, 
you know, we go back to like living like heathens, how our understanding of things like medicine and like bacteria and germ theory and all of that, even if we're working with minimal materials, just that knowledge itself would totally inform and help us rethink how we would do things to manage people that are sick or have an open wound or whatever. Despite the fact we might not have the technology to prove those things, we know them now. And that's, I think, kind of how we need to start thinking about if we go back in terms of the technology we're using, how do we appropriately utilize the knowledge we have today because of the technology that exists today that might not exist in the future? Elliot's just staring at me. <laughs> well, I'm, no, I'm thinking. This is my thinking face. <laughs> no, so you're right. We can't go back and we can't stay as things are. And I, I think you're correct in saying that ancestral knowledge is what's going to tie those, the action to move forward, as well as bring in knowledge from the past like with us so that we can fix those problems or at least attempt to. But speaking of looking back, didn't you say Irish people aren't the original Irish people? Are we ever going to talk about that? How far back do we have to go? Yeah, so like, uh, I know you wanted me to speed up. So like 30,000 years ago, people landed in Ireland, and they were there for a bit, hunted, hung out, did some mushrooms, I don't know, and then disappeared. So there was like a 20,000 year gap without people. So technically speaking, the Irish we know today are not the original inhabitants of the land. So they're colonizers. Right? Fucking colonizers. Anyways, this has been fun. Uh, so the lesson today is that we should ride in more boats with bears, preferably rabid bears, with Gatling guns. I have more questions. Do you? They didn't have Gatling guns. No way. Goatling guns. I like Goatling, goatling guns. Is that, is that the meme with the goat with two AKs on the side? It, it is. And that is my favorite goat I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of goats. Beast of war. <laughs> Furious, ferocious beast of war. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, this is Andy and this is the Poor Pearls Almanac. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this and tune in for next week's interview where we'll be talking more about the stuff. Yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you later. Bye.